Welcome to another episode of the Blue Crew, a New York Rangers podcast on the Believe Podcast Network. I'm your host, Johnny Lazarus, joined by my good friends, Avery Zaretsky and Cody Frankel. We got a great interview on this episode with Sean McDonough from ESPN, who is the lead play-by-play broadcaster doing the entire Eastern Conference Final. Avery and I spoke to him for over an hour. Cody couldn't make it, and we talked shit about Cody while he wasn't on it. So you can look forward to that. Cody's face, obviously, is not very happy right now. Uh Cody, what's going on? He's got his nice little corporate vest on. Yeah, what's going on, dude? You just hop Zen. off of Microsoft Teams? Bro, I don't even want to talk about today, bro. <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone made a hilarious comment on the YouTube. It was like, because Cody and I were just winking at each other randomly, and I just tried to do it, and you weren't paying attention. But it, it, I saw it, you like, doing that, but I didn't know yes. what was happening. It, it was it was a bad attempt. It was funny though. You were you were like talking and Cody and I were just randomly winking at each other. <laughs> and the YouTube His bro, John goes on a rant for like 18 minutes and he's yeah, like, dude. I need to vent right now. I'm passionate. <laughs> oh man. But yeah, Sean McDonald was amazing. I man. literally cannot wait for you guys to hear it. He's he has some great stuff in there. And him and I are basically friends now. We're gonna play golf together. Yeah. I can't wait. All right, let's get into fan questions. But before we do, I just want to talk about oh, we're- we're not even going to talk about the Panthers or anything. Just going to go right. <laughs> yeah. 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 But before we do, I just, I just want to talk about, yo, yo, I'm fooling you both. You think, I'm away, about, dude. you think I'm about to talk about bet online, but I'm not, I'm actually about to talk about Avery. So <laughs> I just want to talk about the Morgan Wallen concert for a second. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear that. Okay, oh yeah. You're going to do, dude, you are the worst. <laughs> yeah. segment, the worst. Dude, that was pretty, fucking, that that was was pretty good. good. You got me, dude. You got that me. That was a pretty good one. So <laughs> Avery was at the Morgan Wallen concert. Literally, I could, I was touching his head the whole concert. Yeah. And uh, I was probably the best wingman he's ever had in his life. <laughs> Cody. Uh, it was so good to see Cody, man. And you got oh, a great don't you got skip a nice the wingman comment. Share with the class. No, listen, he just Co- Cody did a great job. Dude, as I walked out, I whispered in her ear and I go, guys a fucking 12 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you said. That's all yeah, I said. And then he's left a, the concert. He's uh <laughs> Cody's Cody's a good man. Date, Avery? It was date, dude. It was sure. date. Whatever you want to refer to. We've been talking about the Morgan Wallen concert for like two months, and you haven't mentioned it, once that it was made. It was a it was, great time, yeah. though. Yeah, I gotta say, I gotta say, performance-wise, Morgan Wallen is incredible. Yeah. Uh, his music's incredible, and I had a great time. Cody got a sick hat at the concert, but it wasn't a melon. I, I, w- I wish <laughs> Melon did Morgan Wallen collab because I'd buy a million. But they have a collab with us. If you go to Melon.com slash blue crew and use the code blue crew at checkout. You get 30. I'm talking 30% off of all Three their zero. products. They really don't do this often. So go make sure you go get your melon hats. They they're structured amazing. They're sweat proof. And I love melon. It's really the only hat that I'll ever wear is melon. So go get yours today. Melon.com slash blue crew 30% off. Go now. It's running out soon. Go now. Cody, can you stop breathing so heavily into the mic? I'm literally not breathing. I'm actually holding my breath, as a matter of All fact. Right, the concert, concert was good, boys. You had fun? Yeah. I, the, the, I wish the weather was a little bit better, but I, yeah. it, it's so funny how much longer the bathroom lines are at country concerts because of how much drinking and tailgating there is. It's absolutely mm-hmm. ridiculous. I had to go uh, during a song because it just wasn't feasible to go before the concert. It was insane. It was, yeah. it was the most busy I've ever seen at venue in my life, and oh, I still was, have like half a long nuts. voice from it. Yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. Saturday was uh the weather was interesting. It was like nice out, but like drizzly. Like, I, I got I a real like, reminder of how the northeast weather is because it's like you almost have to have a bad start off for like five months. <laughs> but I'm but yeah, but in, in, in Florida <laughs> you've like been there for three years. <laughs> well in, in Florida, time's like a flat circle, right? It's like the weather, <laughs> it just stays the same almost every single day. So here it almost feels like you have to have a bad day to have a good day. So it was like completely overcast. And then yesterday it was so nice out. Even it's today, gonna be it 77 and sunny this entire week. And I know. like the kid who studied abroad, just like forgot yeah. what it was like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you starts do coming, all back, week. It starts it, coming you, back and talking in French and won't speak English. It was really like dude, do. it was two months. But you do forget how time works in Florida because every day feels the same. <laughs> what about when there's a tropical storm? All right, so you want well, we're not in storm this. season yet, so relax, man. All right, let's get into fan questions. Yeah, are you doing the ref stuff in this series, by the way? No, hell no. Okay. I already told okay. him no chance, man. That right. that ain't that, 
No way. It's going to be weird, though, because some people are going to – I'm going to walk into the arena and people are going to be like, I thought you are the ref. Like, they actually know us as the ref. Oh, really? That's weird. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, well, we're going to talk about the Rangers, Florida Panthers, Eastern Conference Final. We're not going to preview it right now. We assume that we're going to get fan questions that ask us to preview it. So let's get into the fan questions brought to you by Breakaway Payments. Rangers fans, if you own a business or work at a company that accepts credit cards as a form of payment, then listen up. Breakaway Payments has payment processing solutions for retail and e-commerce businesses, custom integrations, and more. So email fellow Rangers fan Brett at brett at breakawaypayments.com or visit their website www.breakawaypayments.com that's www.breakawaypayments.com i am mumbling but breakaway payments will save your business a ton of money on those dreaded credit card processing fees let's go rangers so let me take a second here to pull up our fan questions and thank you guys for submitting them as always we will start with this one from gross underscore ink underscore tattoo do the rangers have enough grit to not get bullied what are the tests you're making <laughs> uh, um, that's a good question too it is a good question no they listen this this team has grit i, I don't think anybody would argue that um would would you say that like to not get bullied though, like would you say the Panthers are are tough guys in the NHL? Like I don't yes. think they're tough. Yes, yes. You they think are. so? Yeah. Oh, yes. Tell me you don't watch Puck without telling me you don't watch Puck. I mean, right? Cousins, Bennett, I mean, Kachuk, they got they're Bennett. all. Yeah, they got Bennett. He's he, he's a little fucker though. I don't know. He's tough. Isn't that the definition of tough? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? I guess. I guess. I guess. I guess. No, they're probably <laughs> a top three tough team in the NHL. So yeah. At least they're good at. I mean, they're also good at. Not like faking it, but they stir shit up after the whistles, you know. Without a they doubt. love the after the whistle scrums. Like that's a big Florida Panther. Yeah, thing. and I think the Rangers have handled that well this year, though. So I'm not too overly concerned with that. I think that the Rangers, when they work at their hardest, they're able to force teams to take penalties. So I think that it could pay dividends for the Rangers that they uh, that the Panthers are a very aggressive, bullyish type team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think we're just gonna need Truba to actually be a bully. Is what we're gonna need. Which he probably will. And Rempe wasn't in the lineup today for practice, but I'm curious to see if he's thrown in for game one. Because this is kind of what we've talked about all year, right? Like, this is the series where you kind of throw – this is the one where you throw Rempe in, right? Like, yeah. it seems like a Matt Rempe kind of series. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but at, we'll at the expense of Blake Wheeler, no chance. What? If Blake Wheeler's – if Blake Wheeler's a go. Wheeler's not in, though. He's not in. Confirmed? Well, right as of today, it was uh, similar to game. It was it was the same lineup as game three against Carolina. It, the top six was the same. Then you had uh, Heedle, Wenberg, Kako, and Cooley, Gaudreau, VZ. Oh, Heedle, Heedle was in. Heedle, yeah. Heedle, Heedle practiced today. I still think you see Rempe or Brodzinski before you see Wheeler. I just don't. Yeah, I don't I, know. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree. My brother, really? my brother and I were we went on a walk today, and I we were just talking about like where he would fit, and. To be honest, the only place I could see Wheeler coming in is if, like, after two games, they're like, Kako isn't doing anything, and we need more scoring. But, yeah. but I, 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 I do think, yeah. I do think they'd put they put Wheeler with Sabanjad and Kreider and move Roslovic down. Yes, hundred percent. But I think but, that would be the only guy that would come out for Wheeler. Kako. Yeah. Interesting. How do you feel about that? Me, I, I mean, listen. I think that you you look at analytics and you see that the third line's been the best line in the NHL in terms of <laughs> dead dude. What? <laughs> yo, yo, no. Johnny, I need you to clip that. I need you to clip that. And I know what? Avery had a bunch to say after NHL, but you got to cut it off at NHL. Yeah, you, had, you took a bad pause at the NHL. <laughs> bad pause. I know what you're about to say. You're about to say in goal, you know, expected goal. You're number know, one, right? And I know that screenshot's that. old. It's not even. That's not even updated. Someone posted that was after, yesterday. dude. That was after game one of the first series. Oh, yeah, because I looked for that today, and they were like thirteenth. Oh. Avery, Avery <laughs> said, no. dude, that, that's yeah, gonna be the best clip. That. That we was... all gotta retweet that too. All right, well, there's my moment of the podcast. <laughs> but anyways, we know that they've been good defensively, right? And they and Cody's been complaining that they haven't been producing offensively. I think there have been people who've been saying that. But if it comes down to a point where they need to produce offensively. <laughs> 
See now, see this podcast is going to become a problem because I had I had my laugh just like about a minute yeah, yeah. ago, and now I know how you felt, Johnny. Yep. And now we got to stop. <laughs> it's got to stop. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Yep. But, but I and you did I, this and you did this to me at the beginning of the pod. Yeah, yeah and I just true. did it to it myself. Back. All right. Well, let's let's rally back here. But um, yeah, I don't okay. know. No, no. Listen, I, I it's it's tough. It's a tough call, right? It's a tough call. Is is I think what it comes down to, and it's it's a matter of of like the team's jiving right now, right? So it's like jiving, yeah, jiving. Oh Never god, Johnny, look it up, dude. Oh my god, you, tell me you're dumb without telling me you're dumb. Okay, I'm look it up right now. So the team, it. Oh man. Okay. So, anyways. Okay, that makes sense. Nice, good word. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um. So the team's jiving right now, and like you know, I think to take out Rempy or Brodzy, like it, it's t- it's tough to put in a Wheeler type guy if he's ready to go, right? But it's like you need that offense, and you're looking for a guy with a ton of playoff experience who can score yeah. goals. Like Wheeler's your guy, so so it's it's going to be a tricky situation. I mean, his comments were kind of crazy, saying like I'm ready to go in any capacity. So like. If he's saying that, I don't see why you don't play him personally. But well, he was in the lineup today. Yeah. So I guess they will. Uh all right. Next one from Krabby Melly64. That's a new one for sure in our questions. Um, what is the biggest challenge against Florida than what the Rangers face with the Canes? I'm gonna say it's it's similar teams and similar styles, but better goaltending and more elite talent. Um, Bobrovsky is better than Frederick Anderson and better than Peter Kachekov. And I will take any day uh, Matthew Kachuk, Barkov, Verhage, and Tarasenko even. Um, you know, all these guys that Florida has up front. Reinhardt. Yeah. Reinhardt. Yeah, I didn't think about Reinhardt. Their best Evan player. Rodriguez on their third line is still a really good player too. Sam Bennett. Like Dude, these guys put four goals. And, yeah. and Brandon Montour too has become one of the best goal-scoring defensemen in the game. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really crazy. I mean, they're... If you think about it, they're very similarly structured to us. That's why I said, yeah, it's, it's yeah. kind of like the same like, thing, but you're just taking their their talent. They're more talented. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no. Like, if you look at them, right, Reinhardt had 94 points, Kachuk had 88, Barkov 80, Verhage 72, and then Tarasenko 55. And if you look at us, what bread have like one sixteen? No, no, I'm saying more talented than the Canes, not than us. Oh, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. They're they're way more top heavy. Like the Canes had more depth, where like their third liners, right, were scoring goals against us. Yeah. Like you saw what they did in in Game Six. They were the game. Um, but the Panthers are a little bit different. But then they, yeah, I mean, they have the pest, right? They have Rodriguez. We know that guy can score in the playoffs. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, it, it's a very good team that we can't take lightly. I think. Anton Lundell, like, didn't he just have the game winner or something like that? Like, in he, scored, he scored a big goal. I, th- I think I it was the game the winner or the Boston game one. No, I think I'm pretty sure it was either the game winner or the the first goal to tie it up. Oh, in game six. Yeah, I think so. The game I, winner was Forsling. I don't remember who scored the tying goal. It might have been Lundell. It doesn't matter. Yeah, but way. but regardless, right? So they have they have they have a lot of players that are that are good players and. You know, they're, they're deep, but they're very like, like they're very similarly structured to us. It's kind of crazy. Cause if you look at our team, I think there's five or six guys that are like 50 points and then above, and then it automatically falls down to like 31 or something like that. And they're similarly structured. So it's going to be, it's going to be a dog fight. It's going to be yeah. a dog fight. Dog. Yeah, we're, we're talking oh. about it. We're talking about a team that was in the Stanley cup final last year. It's going to be a dog fight. That, that hasn't really <laughs> changed much. So yeah, it's going to be Could tough. Do it again. Do it again. Don't fight. <laughs> all right. I'm I'm so giddy right now. Um all right. Next one. This is from Jason from 1989. Better financial decision. Catch a game at MSG or head down to sunrise. For fucking sure, head down to sunrise. Maybe not. Why? Because you have because the sunrise tickets were only like a hundred bucks cheaper than MSG, and you have to fly, which costs more than a hundred dollars. To catch your flight there, it's probably like 300, 400 round trip. But if you go just like Monday to Wednesday, you fly Monday or, or even just Saturday to, to Monday. Saturday it's going to be it's going to be more expensive to fly to Florida. Honestly, the tickets yeah. have been really expensive. My but, round yeah. trip from Saturday to Wednesday was 270. But that's because that's because Raleigh's population is like 11 people. 
So it was I'm a saying different. in Florida. All right, oh, okay. here, here's my take on it because I've been to a lot of Panthers games and I and I live in Florida and this and that. I, I would go to MSG. The The viewing experience is better. It's obviously going to feel better to be at home. But we uh, need more Ranger fans in Florida. So Donnie, do you hear that? Now? Avery lives I in Florida? I, I know. I'm just saying, like, to even, <laughs> just to get, even just to get in the door, it's like 400 bucks in Florida and it's really high up. The, the stadium is is much bigger it's t- it's taller so the seats are a lot higher and farther back and we, we we actually talked to sean mcdonough about it how high the press booth is and like the seats that are up in the back are pretty damn close to it so mm-hmm. uh you're gonna have a better viewing experience at msg better experience overall especially because it's home ice and you get the bob o'reilly factor so go to go to the garden all right. Well, Johnny, Johnny's actually going to go to both the Garden and Florida, so he'll be able to have that experience. So maybe Avery, me, and you should make a bet on which one's better. And speaking of bets, I want to talk about one of our sponsors. <laughs> bet Online is your number one source for all your summer sports: MLB, NHL, NBA, and, and golf. We know Avery loves to golf in that beautiful Florida weather. All the latest stats, news, and scores are available to your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines. Head to the website today. Use your mobile device to get in on that action. And as Avery knows, Bet Online is always where the game starts. Back to the show. All right. Good job, Cody. That was Hold great. On, Connie, are also, do, do you need to stay at my place? Or do you, or do you have to stay? Yeah. Do you need, oh, do you, thank you. Uh, no, I have family and, and stuff down there, but there I appreciate you go. that. Very kind. Thank you. Um, but I'll stay run. run. I could ask that offline. I was just curious. Yeah. Okay. Uh appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Next one. This is actually really funny. Yo, fuck Cody, honestly. <laughs> is that a question? Okay. Fuck you too, Herb. It was me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> all right. Sorry. I just wanted to break that up a little bit. All right, next one from Brandman7694. <laughs> Who do you think needs to step up this series if we want to win? I say Miller. Um, Step up. I, th- I feel like Miller's stepped up. I feel like he's been great. Um, Maybe not offensively. In terms of stepping up, I think I said this to you last week. Uh, easy, like no-brainer to me. It's, it's Wenberg. Like, I think Wenberg is a guy who you're going to look at to try and lock down guys like Reinhardt and, and Barkov and, you know, all, all their top Kachuk, like all their top guys defensively. Um, as we saw in game six, there were a shit ton of odd man rushes. And that is something, you know, you want to limit. Um, I think somebody like Alex Wenberg is meant to do that. Um, but on top of all that, I, w- I would love to see a little bit of offense from him, right? He, he really hasn't shot the puck much. He's been very conservative. I think he only has like one assist to date. Um, and he does have offensive prowess, so I, I he he'd be my guy. I like that, Dave. Yeah, I would say on the back end, I would go Truba. Um, he didn't have the greatest series against Carolina, but I think that he can be really effective for the Rangers in this series. We talked about how it needs to be a more grittier game. They're going to be tough. They're going to be hard on Pox, and he just got to got to be the guy he needs to be. And and also Kako, I I agree with what Cody said on last podcast. I, I think that. He does have offensive ability that he can tap into, and I think that if there's any time to do it, it's right now. Hell yeah! I don't know who my answer is going to be. Um, I don't want to say like needs to step up because he's been good, but and, and this is probably pretty basic. But I feel like Panarin is Panarin. just uh, this is this is one where you know this is a really physical team, and I just hope he doesn't shy away from it. Um, yeah. So it's not like a step up, but it's like a, let's see what you got, you know? Yeah. Um, one of those. All right. Let's go to the next one. Joe TS writing corner. Am I the only one who feels like the Canes were the more challenging opponent? I mean, it's tough to tell because we haven't even played a game yet. So you won't be able to tell until the series starts. But I, I think Florida is going to be. I mean, it's hard to say the toughest test, but I think as far as the compete level goes, like it's going to be, I don't think anyone's going to compete harder than Carolina. You know, Carolina competes their ass stuff. So I think the compete uh, level is going to be the same in this series, but it's not going to be any easier than Carolina. Yeah. I mean, one thing's for certain, right? Carolina had a better coach. So in 
the tight uh, game. Paul Maurice is a pretty damn good coach. Totally. Maurice is a great coach, but I don't think he's as good as Brendan Moore. I just don't. I think Brendan Moore's top three coach in the league. And, you know, along with John Cooper and um, I don't know who I think the third is, but they're my top two. But anyways. No, no shots so, to Lobby, dude? Fucked. I mean, I, Lobby's great, dude, but I need to see more than one year. If he wins the cup, he's number one forever. Um, Don't care what anybody says. Come at me. Um, All right. So anyways, what I was saying is like in, in these tight situation games, right, where it's one goal games, which many of these were. I don't know if we're going to see many of those against the Panthers. It, the Panthers are a high octane offense, and I think we're going to have to rise to the occasion and be a high octane offense. And these might be five to two games, four to one games, you know, six three, maybe five four. Who knows? But I I don't think we're going to see that many. But the game, the important games that are very close, like we're going to look to the co- like the coach to kind of get us there. And I think Carolina was in a better position to do that than the Panthers would be, and we got past that. So, so I I, I do feel good going into this series. Um, I I just think, as Johnny said, right with Panarin, like we're we're gonna need all our guys. Like there were three or four games last series where Mika kind of went invisible a little bit, right? I think we can't have that this series. Like I think we need Mika to ball out. And well, I, think, I don't know if uh, invisible is the, the best word. Uh, no, like, no, he wasn't. In, okay, you're right. I take it back. He wasn't invisible, but I would say there were definitely three to four unimpressive games. Fair? But he was good. He was fine. I mean, the, the games where he fine wasn't impressive. Not what you want out of your number But the one games where he wasn't right. impressive, the whole team wasn't impressive, I feel like. Absolutely. But, but some of these, right? That first question was, who's going to, are we going to have enough grit to beat the Panthers? To beat a gritty team, you got to get dirty, got to get edgy, and got to have ugly wins. And the only way we're having ugly wins in this series is if one or two of our stars in a bad game that the whole team doesn't look great score those grimy and and dirty goals. Like, that's what we're going to need to beat the Panthers, and that's what I'm trying to get at. Listen, they're a strong team. It's Eastern Conference Finals, so it's got to get done. It's got to get done from the top. Yeah, Panarin's got to be the guy. Uh, you said Rangers four. That's that's wild. Um, no, I think I'm gonna go. Oh, we'll do our preview, but yeah, Rangers. Yeah, yeah. we'll six. finish with that. But let's do a couple more questions here. I know Cody's gonna hop uh, shortly. Um, next one from E R H Maddie Yard. Uh, Bob versus Igor Anderson did not play up to expectation. Do we think Bob can outdo Igor? Uh, Avery, you want to go? Well, we talked we talked to Sean McDonough about it a little bit, and he he made some great points. I'll leave his answer to you guys to listen to. But I think uh, that Igor is just the better overall goaltender. Bob has his moments. He's had his moments so far in the playoffs. But overall, game to game, I'm taking Igor. But Bob can steal a game, man. You got to get shots on net in this series. You can't go you can't go soft uh, in periods. It has to be relentless shots on goal from every single angle because he is just on par in terms of numbers with Igor. I I, I like I said, consistency wise, if, if there's a guy I'd rather have in net, it's Igor. But don't overlook Bob. Agreed. All right, let's do three more. Is that cool? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this next one. Mike D92. Will the amount of Ranger fans attending the games in Florida be a factor in this series? I, I think it's going to be like seven home games for the Rangers uh, if it goes seven. I, I mean, listen, Carolina is probably the toughest road environment in the Eastern Conference. And the Rangers went in there and won two out of three. You know, I know they weren't convincing wins necessarily, but they're still tight games that they found a way to do it. You know, I don't think the Rangers are going to be afraid of any road environment in this series not that they were afraid last series but it's not as big of a factor and then on the flip side though florida is a fucking damn good road team so that's going to be different as well like florida does not i think they've won six straight games at td garden against the bruins in the playoffs like they are not going to come in to msg and be afraid um yeah you know there's a team that knows how to get fans out of the game and i think on both sides there's no like clear cut home ice advantage here but you know the rangers on the road i think have more of an advantage than the rangers did on the road in the last round. That was perfectly said. Thanks, dude. Kind of think we should leave it at that. All right. Dave? Good job, Johnny. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, Shane Bullen, you have to add a New York Ranger bottom six forward from the past decade. Who is it and who do they replace? What a fucking question that is. Avery? 
I'm thinking back, but was Broussard a bottom six? No, definitely no. not. Nah. Yeah. My first thought was Brian Boyle. Um, I mean, if we're okay. My first Let's thought was, was Brian Boyle, fourth line center. Not that Gaudreau has been great, by the way. Uh, not to replace Barclay Gaudreau, but like to have that big size that, you know, kind of not, not a bully, but, you know, Boiler was a fucking beast. Um, threw the body around, block shots, killed penalties, had some scoring touch. He'd be the perfect fourth line center right now. And our fourth line is who? Cooley, Gaudreau, and um, VZ. I, I'd maybe put in Boyle over Kako, to be honest. Okay. Should I, get, uh, should, I, should, I, should I cheat the system and just say JT Miller? Yeah, it's definitely cheating the system. Okay. Yeah. Although and, he probably uh, was a bottom six player for the Rangers. No, he was. He was our, he yeah. was our fourth line player in, in yeah. our cup run. Um, I'm I guess gonna, that's not really cheating the system. It's kind it's of It's not cheating, but I'll give another one. If we got to get dirty and if we got to get fucking mean and, and you know skate with these guys, I'm going with Daniel Carcillo. Let's, let's okay. get it. Where are you putting him? Who are you taking out? Um... In in whoever whoever that last slot is right now, the exception is if Heedle is playing, um, then I need to rethink things and and I would I would we'd have to take out somebody on the fourth line. Like I don't want to take out VC. He's playing pretty well. Um, I would need to think about it. But if Heedle's a no go, like even if Wheeler was healthy, like for this specific series, I, I'd throw him in there. Mm -hmm. Dave? Yeah, I think. I love I'd love a Jesper Foss. I thought he was great with the Rangers. Loved his game. But now that I'm thinking back on it, wasn't the Brassard Zuccarello Pouliot line the third line technically? I thought Brassard played with Nash in 2014. Didn't he play with Nash and Zuccarello? I don't think so in 2014. I could be I, wrong. I mean, I don't have the lineup memorized. So, but, right, yeah, but regardless, I, yeah, I, I think I would say yes for fast. Maybe, maybe even Dominic Moore. I love the, Dom Moore's game, man. The, Do you have the Dom, Moore, Dom Moore was our second liner. What? I have it. No, yep. Dom Moore? Yep. No, yep. he was yep. not. Oh, no, 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 no. You're right. 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 Cody. Listen, okay. Our third line was Zook, Broussard, Puglia. Yeah. Yep. Oh, really? Who was the second yep. line? Oh, second the first line, line was step on. He was the first second line. line was Hags, Richards, and uh Marty. And then the first yeah. line was Cry, Step, Nash. Yeah. See, yeah. I got my I know my shit. So when was Broussard, Zuccarello, Nash a line? Wasn't that a line at some point? Uh, maybe they maybe later started. on. I saw like eight guys, so that's why I Am got I confused. That out? Fourth line was Dom Moore, Boyle, Dorset, Carcillo, JT, mm -hmm. and Jesper Fast. Mm -hmm. So I could technically say. I mean, Quickie would be a good one too. But yeah, yes, all right, let's 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 get to the last question because I really got. All it. right, last one, and we have like six people asking this, so uh, we'll just make it a general one. Um, X factor for the series, go one player. I guess we said, we said who needs to step up, but this is different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my X factor is going to be because I think the goalies cancel themselves out. We we could always say Igor is our guy, but. It's going to be Adam Fox, man. Oh, that's what I was going to say. You fuck yeah, him. it's going to be Adam Fox. I just think he he needs to he needs to be the guy. He needs to be North Trophy Adam Fox in order to get us to the next step. That's fucked up. Um, all right. I guess I'm going to go with Mika because I think if there's one guy on a team who can physically take over a game and put a team outside of Chris Kreider and put a team on his back and just dominate, it's it's Mika, and, and and we need him to do that. I'm gonna yeah. say the guy who was the X factor in the last series. Who do you think that was? Tro Trocheck. Vincenzo. I I thought Lafreniere. Four goals in three oh, games. Okay. Scored some big five on five goals. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, love those, it. Those 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 four goals are are big. So I'll say Lafreniere has to come up big again at five on five in this round. Um. All um, right. So just series predictions before we hop off here. Start with you. Uh, I got to say, well, I got to say I'm, Rangers yeah. in six. I'm Rangers in seven. I think it's going seven. I'm Rangers in seven. Yeah. This one just feels like it's going seven. Yeah. I don't want, I want it to. to. I think that the Rangers, Rangers get it done six. But so, so, listen, oh, yeah. as long as at this point, as long as they get it done. Yeah. Just get it done. 
All right. Yeah. Well, with that, right. let's send it over to Sean McDonough. Hope you all enjoy the interview. This week on The Blue Crew, it is an absolute honor to welcome on our guest, someone that we haven't had on before, but someone that I think we can call a friend right now. You might know him from his play-by-play in every sport, including golf, including college sports, lacrosse, the U.S. Open. I mean, this man does everything, but as of now, he is the lead play-by-play broadcaster for NHL on ESPN. He's done a lot of great Ranger moments, and one that sticks out is the kid line growing up before our eyes. That's the one that sticks out to me. He'll be doing the entire Eastern Conference Final, and I can't give him the intro that the Empty Netters podcast gave because they're unbelievable at it, but we're going to try to do our best that we can. Welcome to the show, our new friend, Sean McDonough. Sean, how are you? Hey, Johnny, doing well. Avery, good to see you. See you. Obviously, I'm not a big enough deal for Cody, but we'll deal with that <laughs> at another time, yes. And that's the perfect way to start because we actually, funny enough, Sean, after game three in Carolina, we did a communal podcast where we actually put the link out on Twitter and let our listeners join the show. And Cody fell asleep after the game. He's got a one-year-old son. He's a father, got a corporate job. So we had every single listener come on and kind of give him shit. So it kind of worked out perfectly <laughs> that you came on and did the same. I'll have to go back and find that somewhere on video. I'm sure that was <laughs> first to say the least. It was a lot of fun, but. Just from the hockey perspective, we're going to jump into it right away. You're covering the Eastern Conference Final. It's a dream matchup for a lot of fans, especially for Avery and I. Avery actually lives in Miami full-time. He's home right now. So we're going to go back and forth from Florida to New York. But for the broadcasters, it might not be the dream because I know the MSG booth and the Amarant Bank Arena booth are a little bit higher. So is this (laughs) not a dream for you? What's going on with the broadcast booth? MSG is not bad. You know, it's five levels off the ice, right? I mean, the the bridge that we're in, as they call it, is on 10. You take the mm-hmm. elevator to 10. The arena level is on five, as you guys know. So you're five stories above it. But it does hang out over the ice a little bit. The problem in, in a place like Florida is not only is it really high, but it angles back this way. So, uh, you know, Florida is not ideal. I actually sent <laughs> Kenny Albert a text not too long ago just saying, hey, you know, last year in the final, did they build – you or even in the Eastern Conference final because uh, Turner had that as well. Did they build you a lower booth? Because they used to do that for Doc Emmerich and there had been some talk that Turner was going to do it. And I was disappointed when he responded, no, there was no place to put it. So (laughs) uh, we will be in the high booth, I'm afraid, in Florida. Uh, Nobody cares, but, you know, it it does make our job a lot harder. I, I discovered uh, why Doc Emmerich used to use the phrase and it did not go because you know, that's a great way of saying it didn't go in the net. I don't know why because <laughs> I'm on the moon as I'm trying to figure it out. He could have missed the net. It could have, it could have hit the post. It could have hit the goalie. It could have hit somebody up front. And I've gotten better now in the year three here since we've been back of not guessing and you know, kind of trying to cover the, the bases, the, uh, even little things you guys will appreciate this. So, uh, the audio guy, Buddha, is fantastic. I've worked with him for 100 years on all these different events that you mentioned, Johnny. And I don't like to get too much of the crowd noise in my headset because everybody I know in our business who's older is deaf as a stone, right? Because <laughs> they've just been blasting their ears with, with all this noise for all these years. So I always ask Buddha, could you give me, you know, the skate sounds and the goal posts and everything, you know, really low? So all of a sudden you hear ping on the air and people at home would know the shot hit the post, but I didn't because I had him take that microphone out of my ear and I have headphones on. So then I was missing shots that hit the post. So I said, okay, Buddha, we're at MSG. Could you put the, the goal mics back in a little bit? Very early in the game, here comes a chance. I can't remember who the Rangers are playing, but Shesterkin slides over to the right post, ping. And I said, it hit the post. And then they show the replay and it, you know, it missed the net by this much. <laughs> I realized it was Shesterk and Skate that hit the post when he came over, you know, across from one side to the other. So mm-hmm. sometimes, uh, you know, there's a, it's a no win situation, no matter how <laughs> hard you try to deal with it, but call the game. Nobody cares where we're sitting. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like a, a lot of people are hard on the broadcasters, but they don't know what goes into it. I did it in college. It's very difficult, to, especially with hockey. It's such a fast paced game. You, you actually started in hockey in 93, 94. And we we've been talking about the 94 correlations. And now you hear you are calling it again. Who knows? Maybe. Uh, never, never know. Yeah. We went away know. for a while. Um, you know, it, uh, and again, I don't want to belabor the point, but um, you know, it's, it's a much harder game to call than it was 17 years ago when yeah. ESPN was last in, in the NHL. You know, the game is so much faster. 
and it's better. It's a lot better too, but uh, it's still fun, you know, and I guess it's one of the benefits too of having Ray down there is if I'm not sure what happened, uh, he can figure it out. But, yeah, but for those who wonder why the announcers, not just me, but others uh, don't aren't always uh, quite aware of what's happening. I always say to my buddies like here in Boston who go to the Bruins games, all right, buy the worst seat in the upper deck and then look further back and up. And that's where we are. <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact, I was at the Bruins game six the other night against uh, Florida. I thought we were going to be in New York, might be in New York for a game seven with Carolina. And then that didn't happen, obviously. So I was home here in Boston for a couple of days. So I took my nephews to the Bruins game. We had pretty good seats. Um, and I went up to say hi to Brendan Burke between periods. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. This is a reminder, you know, you'd almost rather say, can I just take my microphone to that seat I'm sitting in the stands down there? Because you actually see it a lot better than where, where Brendan was that night. I can also uh, feel some sympathy toward the uh, the goalpost sound that you were talking about before. I do uh, color commentary for Nesson and Hockey East. And every time mm -hmm. I go to Matthews Arena, I I'm in the car for four hours going like this, picking out my ear, trying to get my sound back. So I, I can uh, definitely feel your pain with that one. But um, you know, something yeah, I want to, a lot of nights you leave and you feel like you're at a rock concert, oh. you know, which is great. I mean, you yeah. want it to be, um, you know, you want it to be loud and exciting and we're going to have that in all these venues that, uh, especially at MSG, but Florida has mm -hmm. become a lively place over the last couple of years too, with the, uh, the success of the Panthers. It's uh it's like a front row to Metallica concert for sure. Have What's you been up? to a golden Knights game? Yeah, I was at the final last year. I did uh, all five games for for Vegas, Florida. That place. You're a was... season ticket holder for the Vegas Golden Knights, and you're not deaf. I don't know how <laughs> that's possible. You must be wearing some sort of ear protection because uh, you know they they turn the PA up so loud even without the crowd. So yeah, it's uh, you definitely leave there with ringing in your ears. Well, I'm happy you said that too because you know Avery actually is the one who's been saying this for months now that the Rangers are this team of destiny. And I think it started after that stadium series game, which you called, which was probably the loudest game I've ever been to. Um, you know, you got 80,000 people doing the Rangers goal song. It was probably one of the you know, most chills I've had run through my body. But since that game, and you've had so many incredible, I, I always associate you now with Mika Zibanejad. Like, I feel like every time you're on the call, Mika does something incredible, right? It, it just, he hand scores, hand. he's got me in a lot of commercials and promos. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> I scream his name with a lot of enthusiasm, apparently, because uh, it seems to keep showing up. In the corner, Lafreniere. Fox, down low, they score! Mika's a Zibanejad! It's every time. And just, I wanted to get your opinion on, on this whole Team of Destiny vibe around this team. Since that game, you've done a lot of Ranger games this year. Have you felt it, too? And you can admit it just a little bit if you have. Well, you know, I think... Teams that sort of take that on are the ones that have a lot of dramatic come from behind wins, right? And the Rangers have done that. I think they set the franchise record this year for comeback wins. So when it keeps happening, you keep feeling like it is going to keep happening. You know, we had that here with the Red Sox in 2018, you know, when they wound up winning the World Series. And they, the whole season, they just found ridiculous ways to win. Uh, you know, whether it was a clutch hit or the other team made a ridiculous error or something. So Teams do take that on. Yeah, I think the hard part now is, you know, no matter who you're playing the rest of the way, I mean, Florida is really good and they're really tough. They're going to be a tough out, you know, and uh, and then you get to the final, uh, whoever you're going to have there is is going to be tough too. So, um, but yeah, there's if you're a fan, there's been a lot of things that have happened in this season to make you believe that it could easily be a team of destiny. And I think the most important thing is they're really good. At, at every facet of the game, and, you know, starting with the goalie. Uh, I think they have a, a terrific defense core. You know, obviously they have an abundance of forwards now, mm -hmm. uh, which will have to be sorted out as this series goes along. You know, they have a lot of guys who want to play and not enough spots for all of them. So to me, that'll be an interesting part of covering this series is, you know, if Wheeler can go and Heedle can go, uh, do they play? Who comes out? And uh, do they change that game to game depending on situations? You know, Peter had, uh, as you guys know, Rempe kind of in on the home yeah. games and not in on the road. And I thought that was interesting too, kind of managing the situation. So, you know, there, there are a lot of interesting storylines within all of that. Yeah, I, I pretty much coined them the team of destiny because it felt like in all the time that I've been alive, I've seen them go to the Stanley Cup in 2014. But even the 2014 team, it was heavily carried by Henrik Lundqvist, right? Like they didn't have 
this mega goal scorer like like a Panera, and they didn't ha- they didn't have that right. So when I think back to 1994, I wasn't alive, but there were so many documentaries written about it. And my dad, grandpa, and uncle actually held up the sign. Now I can die in peace. They were it was a huge part of our family heritage. And really? and yes, when when something like that happens, and they write all these documentaries about it, there's always moments that you think back to, whether it's the Mateau goal, whether it's the Messier game six. And it's starting to build in this season, right? Like you have a you have a game where the Rangers don't play a good game at all, and Chris Kreider comes out in the third period and scores a natural hat trick. Like that's just something you'd expect to see in a do- documentary type thing. Like even that stadium series game, they play an outdoor game against our heated rivalry, the Islanders, in the regular season. They come back and win that. There's just so many moments that you could look back to this season and say. This is 100% a team of destiny. Yeah, and that Panarin, that game was one of them. You know, you guys, I think, nailed it in terms of you're going to pick one that really stands out. It was that one, right? Because it wasn't going very well. And, you know, the Islanders did some things to help them get back in the game. And then the goal was so crazy. I mean, the net comes off, and uh, but it counted. Uh, You know, I thought Dave Jackson proved his worth. I mean, he came on and immediately said, well, here's the rule, and here's what happened, so it's going to be a goal. And it was, so... uh, yeah, it's um, you know it's it's nice that your your relatives got to see it, right? Because uh, you know my dad died; he never saw the Red Sox win a World Series. You know, oh, wow. it was uh, took me a long time to see them win a World Series. So when it finally does happen, you know, it's it's there's a great sense of joy and celebration and almost relief. But then you kind of wonder, like, does it change being a fan? Like when the when the Red Sox first won it, people were like is it going to be different being a Red Sox fan? Now we can't be long suffering Red Sox fans. You know, they, they won. So I don't know if it'll change the fandom for you, Avery, if they win the Stanley cup, but, uh, and I'm glad to say, how old are you? I'm 26. Okay. And I'm, I'm glad Johnny mentioned that you're just home visiting. Cause if you were still in, in your <laughs> there, <laughs> Catch yeah, the I'll do a bedroom, it might be time to move out. But uh, no, <laughs> no. Sean, though, it's, it's funny because Avery and I, so we actually hosted a watch party for game six of the Rangers hurricane series and Avery's dad was there. And when they were down three to one, we were planning the sign for game seven. Would it say, please kill me now if the Rangers blew a three nothing yeah. lead? Well, you know, I was kind of disappointed there wasn't a game seven only because, you know, that would have been ultimate drama. And mm-hmm. One of our programming guys had already given me the opening line that I was going to use was uh, welcome to the world's most anxious arena, which I think it would have <laughs> oh. been, if it, if, which would, would have been a good way to start. But, uh, you know, it's it, it's a great thing for us, obviously, to have the Rangers, yeah. uh, you know, with the New York market and the great TV ratings and all the great storylines in the history and MSG. You know, it's uh, it's great for us and great that for us. That would have been perfect, though. That would have been. Yeah, it would have been, yeah, it would have, would have been a good line. Yeah. It would have, that would have been. Know, good. It would have been true, right? It's. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would have been. That would have been an amazing night. But, you know, part of you know, this team of destiny thing, Freddie Anderson helped. But you mm-hmm. know, as great as Kreider was and the comeback was, I mean, cover the puck at the post, right? I mean, it's not you know, just just cover the puck. And yeah. even the first goal the Rangers scored in that game, you know, in a series like Pro-trap, that. Yeah. You can't have your goalie give up that many soft goals. And I thought there were two in that game. The first one where he kind of couldn't get back on his feet. I thought Brian Boucher did a great job of kind of chronicling that. And then, and then the one at at the post, you know, it was, and you know, Lafreniere's goal, it was that game. That was game four, game four. Game four. Yeah. They all run together, but Mm -hmm. um, you know, Panarin got scored kind of a softy early in the series too. So, you know, when you're when other teams are getting goaltending like you're getting from Igor and the Bruins are getting from Swayman, you know your guy can't give up one or two of those because it's going to be the difference in the game. Absolutely, yeah, my, and it's funny because my grandpa he had to wait 54 years for the Rangers to win in '94, but he always talks about how that season there was just a feeling, right? Like no matter when the Rangers stepped the ice, stepped on the ice, even if they were getting dominated a game, it just felt like they were going to come back and win. And my whole lifetime, there were so many times where the Rangers would be up and I would just feel this, this feeling that, Oh, like they're just going to blow it. But this Mm -hmm. year has been just so different. They haven't, they haven't blown anything. They, they, you know, they struggled in games, but they've always just found ways to stay in it. And now they, they were getting killed and Chris Kreider comes out and he just, puts a puck in the net that probably shouldn't go in, but it elevated them to the, to the next level. And then now 
Yeah, they and they really carried the play. I think they kind of knew, and it's probably what we've been talking about, right? When that happens, you start to think, okay, here we go again. They're, this is going to happen. They're going to find a way to get it done, and uh, ultimately they did. And I think that was big, you know, to get a little extra rest. This time of the year, everybody's so beat up and tired. And, mm -hmm. you know, we did the Eastern Conference final two years ago, and I'm, you guys remember it, I'm sure, more vividly than I do, but you could just see them hit the wall in that Tampa Bay series. I think yeah. they played 20 games in 40 days or something like that, and it just wasn't sustainable. So, you know, to win in four games and in six games and uh, get some rest, I think, is, is really important. And I think it helped the Panthers, too, to, to win in game six and not have to play in a game seven. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to tie it back to, to what Avery was saying and to what you were saying before about Avery's fandom. Um, and sorry for speaking for you, Ave, but uh, Avery had said if they had blown the three nothing lead and lost in seven, he'd probably never be a fan again. And I Ooh. think that's I think that's kind of understandable, though. We all felt that way. But I want to ask you, Sean, too, from from that perspective, you watched the New York Yankees do it right with the Boston Red Sox. You know, you yeah. you, wit you witnessed that oh three comeback. Would it I have did. been a better story for, let's say, the broadcast had the Rangers blown the three zero lead? And now it's Hurricanes, Panthers, or is it obviously better the way it ended out working out? Yeah, you know, I think it's fine either way. As I said, mm -hmm. I, I was kind of rooting for Game Seven just because yeah. you know that would have been great. And I didn't. I don't care who wins. I really don't. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of times people on social media think <laughs> who wins, but uh, we're really. Yeah, and as I said, we're. I'm happy the Rangers made it because I think it, it probably it would it will have higher ratings than we would have had they not made it. Just mm -hmm. that's the reality of you know what what we do care about. And you just hope for exciting games, right? Memorable games that people are going to have enjoyed having watched. So, um, yeah, but it's, you know, that Yankee thing, especially the history, you know, I, I, I've told the story before. I think I told it on your, your buddy's uh, the yeah, Power Empty podcast yeah. about, you know, when they were Red Sox down three games to none of the Yankees, I, I was sort of relieved because I had committed many, many months ago to go to my friend's wedding in Hawaii. And, uh, and so I wasn't going to be there for the World Series when they won it. And uh, so it's three nothing. I'm like, oh, well, no big deal. Now at least I won't be agonizing over about being at Mark and Christine's wedding in Maui, and mm -hmm. we all know what happened. So uh, I was, however many six thousand miles away when the Red Sox won the World Series for the first time in my lifetime. But they're, they're your friends, right? It's more yeah. important than sports. Did I really say that out loud. No. I think <laughs> I, you guys watch that podcast. You know, when I when I got there after like the twenty hour trip. From Boston to Maui and got to the hotel. Christine was in the lobby, the bride, and she said, "I can't believe you came. I told Mark to tell you it would be okay if you didn't come." <laughs> I was like, "Well, you're a good, that was good information to have 20 hours ago before I got on the plane." But yeah. uh, no, I'm glad I was where I was, even though it was you know, I wish I was there when the Red Sox won. I'm curious, you know, often broadcasters are in movies, and I'm curious if your voice has been featured in like Fever Pitch, and I know you did. The Winter Olympics in, in in bobsledding in the '90s or Cool Runnings, and I couldn't find if it was or wasn't. I didn't go back. Yeah, and watch the movie. I was in a movie called Mr. Baseball, just my voice. Okay. With uh, Tom Selleck. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think if there's if there have been other ones. Do you get a um, check for that or no? What's that? Do you get a check for that? Yes, not much. <laughs> <laughs> like eighty nine cents every time he comes minimum on. Minimum scale was I didn't even have to. You know, I had to go to a studio in Boston and probably took ten minutes. <laughs> it was a dream sequence. He was a baseball player, and I was like narrating his dream. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's about it. In ninety ninety three ninety four, you obviously were doing the broadcasting at that time for the NHL, but then this long stint comes of, of no hockey with ESPN. Right. And now you're back. This is the third, I think this is the third season that you guys are back. What was it like coming back to hockey? Because it, you've done all these major sports and you've done the Olympics, but this is probably the most fast paced sport out of all of them. What's the adjustment like, at, you know, going 17 years without being a hockey broadcaster to coming? Yeah, back? it was a big one because I said, you know, I was used to, Oh, you know, here comes the guy carrying the puck out of his own end. And you'd look down for a, statistic or a note or something you'd look up and the guy was still carrying the puck out of his own end or stuck yeah. in some sort of neutral zone trap where no one's going anywhere and uh so you know i think the rule changes uh, helped a lot and you know i i learned the hard way you know a couple times i looked down look back up i don't know what happened there was a penalty what happened the puck's in the net how'd that happen you know it's and you feel incredibly incompetent when stuff like that happens so you know it took a little bit to realize okay don't look down, go when the pucks in play, keep your eyes on the ice. And, um, 
but it's fun. But to me, that's what makes hockey fun is the pace of it. And, you know, you can almost do kind of a radio style call on TV because, you know, the puck moves so quickly, different players have it in rapid succession that you need to identify. So I was thrilled when we got it back. I was always hoping that we would never knowing if we would or would not. And then, you know, as soon as I found out we had it, I texted Jimmy Pataro, who runs ESPN. I don't know what his title is, but he's the chairman and CEO or president or whatever. Mm-hmm. I said, you know what, I'm at this stage of my life, I'm just going to go right to the top. You know, the worst thing they can do is just say no. So I texted him and he texted back saying, that's great to know. You know, I'm, I'm going to be involved in the decision, but there'd be other people, but I'll let everybody know you're interested. And so when it happened, I was really thrilled because, you know, I, I grew up with hockey being my first love. You know, when I was a kid, Bobby Orr was the man. He's still the man here in Boston, actually, for a lot of people, including me. But, you know, those are the, the good Bruins teams of the late 60s and early 1970s. Great Bruins teams, some of them. And uh, so that was always my my first love and my favorite sport. And every kid on my block wanted to be Bobby Orr. And um, and then, is, is, you know, to your point, John, about, you know, the, really the first good opportunity I got out of college was at Nesson doing Hockey yeah. East games. Yeah. And that was a blast. And what's fun now is, like, now I'm doing games that the sons of guys who I did their games for are now playing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Montgomery, yeah, too, Sullivan right? Sullivan was playing yeah. at BU. David Quinn was playing at BU. David Quinn is uh, one of my best friends all the way back to when he played at BU. And uh, so, you know, that now I'm running into them as coaches or scouts or assistant coaches, but you're also, hey, that's my son, that's my nephew, who's now playing on some, some of these teams. So, uh, but I love doing the college hockey. We had the Beanpot Hockey Tournament here, which is one of the great uh, traditions in college hockey. And always loved doing that particularly in the old garden where you were kind of right on top of the ice you didn't have to worry about not being able to see the puck there because you you were so close in the first row of the balcony you could actually hear conversations on the ice Mm -hmm. when the players were talking to each other the officials were talking to the players whatever so yeah it's uh i love hockey really just kind of feel like now i'm getting back up to speed you know in, in year three now you know the players you know the coaches uh, you know how to get to the booth. It's little stuff like that you don't think about. Um, but you know, the first year, like, where's the booth? How do we get there? Where do we go to get into the building? You know, that sort of stuff. Um, now all of that's secondhand. And, you know, it, there's a rhythm and a flow to it, as you guys know, that uh, just takes a while. And when we don't do a lot of games, I mean, the reality is, I think I did two games from the start of the year. We did Bedard's opening night. Yep. And I did one more game before the beginning of the year. So in October, November, December, then we start up at the Saturdays, but those are really just one a week. So you don't get a lot of reps until you get to this time of the year. And it's really only now for me where you kind of feel like you're in a flow. And it's nonstop for you guys too. I know I'm, I'm really good friends with Emily Kaplan and, you know, I know how her travel works and, you know, every night she's in a different city. Um, you yeah, know, next she's time all over the place. She does you're gonna have to come job. for a drink with us next time we go after, yeah, I'd be happy uh, to. after her game. She's a lot of fun. In addition, we, uh, to being really good at what she does. Yeah, she's she's the best, and um, you know, the whole crew, you, Ray, Emily, uh, it, it's it's awesome that you guys are going to be a part of it. Um, you know, this series is something obviously we're incredibly excited for. You know that from talking to us now for about thirty minutes. I want to ask you about Peter Laviolette though, because you mentioned your Boston background. Uh, Peter mm-hmm. Laviolette's also a Massachusetts guy. Do you guys yeah. have a lot well, of familiarity he talks over like years? He's from Canada? I don't know when that started, but uh, who said he's from Canada? No, he talks like he's from Canada. He speaks oh, really? a Canadian accent. Which is definitely not how they speak in Franklin, Massachusetts. But yeah. I guess you know you've been around for hockey, for hockey that long that you probably take to it. It comes out a little bit, I guess. I'll have to notice that next time I talk to him. But do you have a previous relationship with him, maybe, or or just like you know? The... Not really. No, I knew of him. Obviously, you know, kind of knew of him. You know, you know, back in the early '90s, he was on one of the Olympic teams. The um, and um, you know, Ted Drury, who's Chris Drury's brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ted's married to Liz Mercury Drury, who um, whose dad, this is kind of a convoluted story, but not really. Her dad, Ted Drury's father-in-law, was the president and general manager of Channel 38, Dan Mercury. He was the one who hired me to do the Red Sox games when I was 25 years old. So I've oh, always been very close to the Mercury family. You know, Liz Mercury Drury is Jack Drury's mom, mm-hmm. who's just, you know, played obviously for Carolina against the Rangers. So um Ted and Peter Laviolette were on one of the Olympic teams. I think it was 94. It would have been in Lillehammer. Um, so, you know, I knew of Peter then, you know, especially from Massachusetts. Ray Ferraro always teases me. 
if you're like Chris Kreider, I can't say enough nice things about him. <laughs> Massachusetts. He went to school in Massachusetts. You know, he's, his relatives are still here. So um, you got a good chance of me saying something nice. So I've always kind of just been interested in Peter's career because he's because he's from here. Well, I've got something for Has you. Any too. guest ever put their video on hold and muted themselves? So I'm I'm, I'm an allergy sufferer this time of the year, and I have the overwhelming desire to blow my big Irish. Whatever note. you gotta do, we I can to do that. Would that be we, history making? We can edit you know, it out. I will be ask. I will be listening to your question uh, with with great <laughs> eagerness as I mute myself. Okay, I guess he's muted. Fair enough, Sean. We appreciate the the courtesy of telling us. Um, also, we only have like a couple more too, so we don't want to keep you too long, but. This one, you know, I'm planning for the right time to ask. I Peter. will stay as long as you want, by the way. The, uh, <laughs> we actually I, got Cody I has a free 30 minutes to do the intro in, in about 30 so minutes from now. So we got to get <laughs> Cody's. Oh, uh, we got to turn this time. around, as they say in the biz. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But kind of speaking about Peter Lobby. Is this better without Cody, by the way? Do you guys feel like <laughs> this is a much better flow? We actually purposely scheduled these interviews when he can't uh -huh. make it. Exactly. So See, it goes It goes well. Smart man. <laughs> Um, I'm but just I, glad Avery didn't have a tea time because I know he would. <laughs> no, himself. not not today. Probably probably tomorrow, but not today. Loyal listener to the Blue Crew, Sean McDonough. Everyone knows that. I've been waiting for the right time to ask Laviolette this because I know he's very day by day. But you know, speaking to Avery's this year feels like a documentary. Um, something you can may maybe you know you guys can use it on the broadcast. But Peter Laviolette to me, this story is starting to feel full circle for him, where you know he played division three hockey was an Olympic teammate of Brian Leach, Mike Richter. Um, you know, the guys that won it in 94, he played 12 games in the NHL only for the New York Rangers coached the hurricanes to a Stanley cup coached the Washington capitals the last three years. He goes through those two teams. He's now with the team he played for, you know, looking to win a cup for the first time in 30 years. It, it's starting to feel like it's, a full circle thing for him. You guys are big into this destiny thing. A little bit, a little bit. We're, we're kind of cheesy on this show. Dude, I know dude. if I asked him though, he wouldn't necessarily give that response. You're kind of looking for right now. No, Cause hundred percent. No, we our pregame meetings with him are very short. Not a lot of information, you know, you're not going to get a lot of information. So I don't sit there and try to like drag it out of people if they, mm -hmm. you know, and he's not the only coach, especially this time of the year. You know, we, there's a couple other coaches who we've dealt with the last three years who during the season, regular season, here are the lines. Here, yeah, our goalie's going to be that guy, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they'll tell you some stuff. And then in the playoffs, that even that stops, yeah. which I think is silly, right? I mean, <laughs> these teams prepare for each other. You know, oh, Johnny Brodzinski, we didn't know anything about him. What are we going to do now? You know, how does he play? You know, I think that if, no matter who's out there, they're going to have a, a pretty good read on what he's capable of doing. Well, the boss and goaltending situation was the funniest, right? Like not announcing who's going to start till like an hour before or whatever. And Montgomery's kind of holding it in his back pocket of if they're going with oh, Swayman yeah. or Omar. Well, we've had others. We had one coach last year throw us kind of a misdirection on who the goalie was going to be in our pregame meeting, which didn't sit very well. But uh, really? Oh, yeah. I, I'm going. Yeah, yeah. Don't, no, no, uh, no. Involve the Rangers. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Wow. But That's not cool. the Ranger coach. No. <laughs> that should that should narrow it down a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It is funny on this show that that is a funny moment. And I always like to ask, you know, whether we have a former player or broadcaster on, is there a moment? Because we know how ho hockey players and coaches, they're so animated, right? And they always have these good character roles. And and we, we even asked Don LeGreco this question. And he told us one time John Tortorella pulled him into an office and he said that he fucking hates him. But <laughs> <laughs> but but he respected his job so was there any kind of moment that you can obviously tell on here that was funny that that you always remember in the hockey as aspect and world and those sorts of things like coaches either upset with you or that's just the anything, route he went even yeah. like a great interaction with a player yeah. that that you can always remember and think about as something that you really enjoyed uh yeah you know it's, it's another reason why i want to get back into the hockey because the hockey people are the best right i mean it, it just it, as a community they're the nicest friendliest most cooperative uh, of all the major sports and that hasn't changed in the 17 years that that we were out of it uh, you know I'll, I'll tell you the, the thing last year and it, it was you know uh, <laughs> the we, there was the devils and the rangers yeah, yeah. and uh emily had been at the skate that morning and akira oh. schmidt was clearly going to enter the series and it was out on twitter and the whole thing 
So we were meeting with Lindy Ruff before the game and Ray said to him, hey, we know you're not going to talk about the goalie because he was one of these who doesn't tell you. And that, as I said, that's fine. They can all do what they want. Um, the, so he said, if, Akira Schmidt, if, if it happens to be him, what would you want us to know about? What should we know about Akira Schmidt? You know, like, what's the scouting? What's he good at? What, what do you like about him? Not like about whatever you want to say. And he thought for a second, he said, I don't want to answer that because I don't want to steer you guys down the wrong path, which we took to me. Don't worry about Akira Schmidt. He's not playing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would have gone up and read another article or two about him. You know, our graphics people did like, well, he plays, right? So that one um, didn't sit so well with my occasionally short Irish temper. And, and Ray <laughs> can be a little, <laughs> a little snappish from time to time too. So um before the next game you know you're, you're in the hallway and it's all the handshakes hey how you doing you know so i just said hey before we do this um you know i'm okay if people don't want to answer the questions but you know i kind of felt like we were intentionally misled i said because let me repeat what ray asked and what you said and then how did we get this wrong and he was defensive at first and then you know he said he didn't mean to mislead us and that's not what he meant and the whole thing but um so that was a, that was a contentious interaction it, it, it was it was i don't want to say hostile but it was tense for mm -hmm. probably four or five minutes the pr guy intervened and you know but we have a job to do right and the my attitude on this is first of all if we ever violated anybody's confidence a coach a player they sell tell us something in confidence we go tell the other team we're fired right and we should be i mean that's the ultimate violation i would expect to be fired I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. You know, I, I've never done that in my life. I've been told a lot of things in confidence by a lot of players and coaches. So first of all, we wouldn't do that. So whatever their fear is that we're going to do with the information, uh, it would stay with our group. And we pay the NHL a lot of money. Um, you know, these players and coaches are making a lot in part because of the revenue they get from their broadcast partners. So I don't think to ask for five to 10 minutes of cooperation and honesty is a lot to ask. And uh, and we don't always get it, but it's okay. It's it's kind of part of the ritual, right? I mean, it's, you, you go into it knowing uh, some of these coaches are going to be great and tell you everything, and some of them are going to say nothing, and most are somewhere in between. When it comes to that, I imagine this is going to be a fun one with Paul Maurice, right? Like, he's been unbelievable. Uh, I didn't really know him much, you know, uh -huh. um, and uh, didn't really have an opinion from afar. And then he's, first of all, he's a really smart guy. Yeah. And he's obviously very funny. And I just love that he's enjoying this, right? I mean, it's like he's blessed to do what he's doing for a living. You know, he's had an incredible career and he's still only in his late fifties. And I'm just glad to see somebody enjoying a job that he should be enjoying. You know, a lot of these coaches treat it like they're going to the electric chair at seven o'clock, you know, when the faceoff starts. And, you know, how many coaches would kill to coach one game in the NHL? Never mind be in the Eastern Conference Finals. So, you know, I, I would love to see these coaches enjoy it more, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I get it. There's a ton of pressure, but at least now they're paid a ridiculous amount of money to deal with the pressure. Unlike, you know, the old days when they weren't paid what they are now. That, that makes me feel. Yeah. And I'm not disparaging Lindy Ruff. I mean, we, no, no, no. it was, for, you know, the, the PR guy texted me 20 minutes later and said, Hey, Lindy feels really bad. The game hadn't even started. You know, he didn't, wasn't mean to do that. You know, Lindy and I sort of had a, triangular friendship because he was an assistant for David Quinn mm -hmm. with the Rangers before he went for the devil and Quinn, he's one of my best friends. So, you know, we've both been talked about to each other. You know, I've heard a lot of great things about Lindy from Quinny. Lindy had heard nice things about me from Quinny and Quinny's wife. So, you know, it's, it, it's, I don't mean it to sound like it was some yeah. big deal, but it, wow. you know, you don't expect to be in the hallway two hours before the game wondering if this is going to accelerate into something that it really shouldn't be. And I, you know, if it did, I wouldn't like my chances against Lindy Ruff to be quite honest. So uh, <laughs> not that it would ever get to that, but he, he is a really cool. sweet guy. I will say. I, yeah. I, I like Lindy. I mean, well, the, before the next game, when he came out of the locker room, he came walking over to me, said, Kerry Quinn told me I need to give you a hug. And he gave me a hug. So, <laughs> See, that's the story I'm looking yeah. for. That's yeah. good stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that was a big that. detail you left out, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm sorry. I, I should have because Carrie, you know, Carrie's one of the greatest people I know. It, 
-hmm. David Quinn is a, one of the great people I know, but and you talk about overachiever in marriage, uh, he, he would be high on that list. So I mentioned it in the intro, you know, one line that sticks out is the kid line growing up before our eyes, you know, Ranger mm -hmm. fans, I think randomly throughout a day on a random Thursday morning, you'll see that shift posted on Twitter. Uh, Ranger fans are attached to that, but now it might be, you know, the the game winning Chris Kreider goal in Carolina that could take over as the shift apparently in, in, amongst Ranger fans. But curious if you could redo one Ranger call that you've had in the last three years, or oh, or you know one that you really oh, there's probably several. You know, especially at the beginning, where as I said, where you're you know you're guessing and you shouldn't be guessing the wrong guy. There's not one where I thought, wow, I completely botched that, but they're mm -hmm. probably. You know, if there's one, it doesn't involve the Rangers. You'd like to do again. It was that weird goal that uh, Colorado scored in the Stanley Cup final, where it went up and it stuck under. Yeah, the, the Cadre overtime goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't even know he scored. I mean, he's no. like smashing a stick over his knee. The goalie sort of knew it went in. The ref didn't know. You know, and I think it was Bo Byram, Stamkos, and Bo in. Byram, Stamkos, and Bo Byram were yeah, the only ones who saw it. At, like where the puck was, mm -hmm. and you know, you're like. I lived my whole life to call the Stanley Cup final. <laughs> That's the game winning goal. <laughs> you know, it's like, but the good thing was that the skate the next morning, uh, before the next game, you know, the the radio guys for each team were there, the Canadian TV guys, um, you know, the national radio guys. And I walked up to every single play by play guy. I said, Did you call that in real time? Did you know that was a goal? And every single one of them said, No, it was like the worst moment of my life. So the uh I remember being really distraught after the game. And then Mike McQuaid, who runs our hockey coverage and he has to pen, he's like, Sean, the guy who scored the goal didn't know it was in the net. So I mean, <laughs> he was a lot closer to it than you were. So don't worry about it. Nobody knew it was in the net. Like, so if there's one in three years that but there have been several. Why? Is there a ranger call that I should no, no, no. I, I think I didn't mean it as like a call that you didn't do well. I meant a, so I meant okay. a, like, you want to say, Hey, you really, we're friends now. So yeah. if you want to say, Hey, you really botched that one. No, no, I, I more so meant you like you know, many games as I've done. You botched a few, but yeah. you know, the kid thing is, was funny because like, I, I kind of got the feeling with, with the Ranger fans and I don't do social media, but people do. And they tell you, Oh, geez, you know, my sister who lives in New York city, by the way. And, uh, works at MSK and um, and she's the best. She does have to do social media for a job. And she's like, mm. well, a lot of hockey fans like you, but the Ranger fans really don't like you. They're mean. And I don't know because of the Boston thing or whatever, but I'm like, why? You know, I, I you know. So that one, I think softened them a little bit. And I think part of the problem is everybody likes watching their own announcers, right? Sam Rosen's one of the all time greats in the history of what we do, you know, Hall of Famer, all time, list all the great hockey play-by-play -play guys. He's on the list and you don't go very far down. Kenny's as good as anybody is in, mm -hmm. in our business. They're both great guys. Don, you mentioned earlier, he's terrific. You know, the and, and Joe Micheletti, you know, the rest of the group, all the analysts. Um, so you know, there's a really high standard of broadcasting that you guys are used to. So yeah. um, you know, I get it, but you know, I'm a nice guy. I don't dislike the Rangers, even with my mm -hmm. Boston uh heritage, you know, it's as I said, I think it's great that the Rangers are in the Eastern Conference Final because it's great for ESPN, and ultimately that's where my foremost loyalty is. So we just hope for really exciting games. <laughs> no, they're so mean. And, Sean, I, I'm one of the biggest Rangers fans in the world, especially on the Internet. All I do is talk about the Rangers. My life revolves around them, and I'm known as the positive guy, right? And no matter what happens, I, I always like to find a positive spin because it's a long season, right? And if I say something, one positive thing after a bad game, it's like, you suck. You know, you're so I annoying, know. this and that. Well, and you I'm are, a Ranger, Avery, you, and you I'm are a Rangers annoying. fan. <laughs> I, yeah, people think I'm annoying. But I'm, I'm too, a he's fan. too positive. He's too positive. And I'm a Rangers fan. So so when when there's, there's something wrong that, with well, it, social media is definitely not the place for you. If you're just positive. <laughs> right. One exactly. Of the reasons I have steadfastly avoid it because yeah. it, unless you want to know how much you suck, it's probably not the place that you want to go. So uh I, I, I don't, I don't even have a Twitter app or whatever you call it. So, um, right. Yeah. It's, but it's fine. People are entitled to their opinion. I tell friends of mine who are in our business, like I've worked with people who are analysts who I've worked with, who they'll search their name, like during commercials. Yeah. And I, what do you expect that it's going to be positive? You know, people, you know, and I have one buddy might say, I've never had people call me a douchebag so many times <laughs> in my life. I was like, 
well, what do you expect? You know, don't go there. If you're looking for affirmation, that's not the place to go. And it's fine if people enjoy it and want to vent whatever they want to vent. But, you know, you just, the people in our business who pay attention to it are the ones that I feel sorry for because you're just going to make yourself miserable. I'm glad you made that point because I wanted to clear the air for you because I know as a broadcaster, you're not biased in any way, but I, there, there are certain reasons why Rangers fans could feel like you had hard feelings against the team, but I never felt that way at all. Mm-hmm. But what I, I want to know, what would they be? Like I've known Chris Drury since he was in high school. As I said, his, you know, his brother-in-law is my friend and his sister-in-law is one of my best friends. Mm-hmm. His Liz Berkeley Drury. I've mentioned this I think during the Carolina Jack's mom was one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen. She's one of the great women's lacrosse players of all time. She's in the Harvard athletic hall of fame. And, uh, a tremendous athlete but you know i you know i have no i have no matter of fact one of my after bobby or my next favorite bruin was jean rattel but you know who is yeah. like, better known for being a great ranger right one of the nicest men i've ever met so um yeah i i believe me i harbor no uh negative feelings about the mm-hmm. rangers I, it's great for espn that they're there you know do i wish they hadn't fired quinny sure of course <laughs> It's like, we found I it. We found I, out why. Got it. Ranger fans, right? It, this will probably spur all kinds of negative comments now about me. <laughs> he, I honestly believe if he had gotten the one more year, they added some of those gritty guys that they really needed. Shesterkin had the kind of season that he had in that first year for Gerard Gallant. They would have had this, the same yeah. success. He, yeah. he did a lot of the. He and Jeff Gordon, I think, are underappreciated. Jeff Gordon, in particular. I mean, this Ranger team, you you go up and down the lineup you know, who, who's going to play in game one, how many of the, the 20 guys who are going to address or the 19 are going to play are guys that Jeff Gordon brought in. Yeah. Right. 14, 15. Mm-hmm. A lot. I mean, well, yeah, Trocek, and- which I think was a great, absolutely great signing. He's been one of the best players in the entire NHL this year. Uh, to me, he's one of the top 10 players in the league this year with everything mm-hmm. that he's done. Uh, the guys at the deadline this year, but all the key guys were there, right? So, and, you know, when Quinny had to go through the growing pain, you know, what's the difference between Lafreniere now and Lafreniere two years ago? Well, a lot of that, or Keandre Miller, or all the guys that Quinny was told, we know they're 19, 20 years old. We don't care. We don't expect you to make the playoffs. Play them, let them get the experience, make them better players, blah, blah, blah. All of which he did. So I know they didn't win enough for Ranger fans when, when Quinny was the coach, but... To me, he, you know, he had a winning he, record. He, he had a winning record. They didn't expect to make the playoffs. They even told them that. Like, mm-hmm. this is not, they were gearing for the next year. Yeah. They know everything and all their meetings and conversations. And then he didn't get the next year. Right. So, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, it's co- coaching in the NHL. You, if you're the coach for 15 minutes, you've lasted a long time. So, you know, look at Gerard Glant. He came in, yeah. had two, 100 plus point seasons and, was well, yeah, so New York is New York's such a hard market, and it took a lot, a lot of balls for Jeff Gordon to come out and say, for after all these years of the Rangers going out and buying guys to to essentially retool the team to go into a full rebuild, the Rangers aren't known for doing that. So for him to go out and do that and say that and make that and look what happened now, right? I mean, look, right, Eastern Conference Final two years out of three, and you know, and the future is still pretty bright. And even, you know, uh, I was thinking about Jeff Gordon the other day. I remember when Quinny was the coach, um, Chris Kreider's deal was up and he was a free agent. And there was a lot of debate about, oh, I'm not sure I'd give him that much money. And, you know, he's a nice player, but, and, you know, and look how his position in Ranger history has changed since they did sign up to the contract and everything he's done these last few years. You know, he's had the best years of his career. But, you know, Jeff was the one who made that decision. And I'm sure you guys remember it. There was a lot of debate. I don't know if you had your podcast back then, but you might have wow. debated back then on this podcast about, you know, should they move on or should they keep them? So that turned out to be an important decision, too, as we all know. And we probably 100%. would have said they should move on and we would have looked like fucking idiots. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he would have yeah, made absolutely. us look stupid. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, but, Sean, just like away from hockey a little bit, you know, you're going to be here now for a week or so then in Florida. You know, what are the things that you like to do in New York City on the off days? Because I know they don't come often. So how do you like to take your mind? Yeah, they don't. Um, You know, obviously, there's a tremendous amount to do. See, my sister would be number one. Yeah. She's the person I know. 
she's up there at MSK trying to save lives. Nothing more mm -hmm. important than being involved at the front line of the fight against cancer. And matter of fact, I just lost one of my dearest friends uh, less than four weeks ago at I'm 62 sorry. to cancer. Yeah, it's been it's been hard. You know, like players, coaches, all of us, right? You're, you're sitting there. Matter of fact, I was doing the game in Toronto. Um, the, the, my buddy had died that morning. It hit him fast. I mean, he probably got diagnosed and died in two months. Great guy named Rick Miller is from Hartford, Connecticut. Originally, my golf buddy here in Boston. And uh, matter of fact, good buddies of David Quinn, just to tie it back to Quinny again yeah. from from golf. But the uh, so we had done four games in four days. You know, we did the afternoon game, the Sunday afternoon, the Rangers started the series against the Capitals. Uh, we were in Boston um, the next night. Then um, we were back to New York for game two. And then we were, uh, went up to Toronto. And as I was getting on the plane at LaGuardia at seven o'clock in the morning, after having done a Ranger game the night before, about to do our fourth game in four days, you're already tired. And, you know, game day game travel is stressful. And going into Canada adds a layer to that. And Rick's wife, Jen, texted me that um, Rick had passed away at 12.04 a.m., so about seven hours before. So Ray had met, Ray was sitting next to me on the plane. He had met Rick when I took him to Boston Golf Club. Rick played golf with us because he's a big hockey fan. So anyway, um, now we get to Toronto and I'm on the phone all day with Jen and other friends and trying to help make some arrangements. And I get to the game. See, first time in my life I ever had a Celsius. I, might, I don't know if I'm allowed. Yeah, to... they're, they're good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're good. I said to the stage manager, Ivan Sikorsky is fantastic. You might've met Ivan after one of these games with Emily, mm -hmm. but the, uh, said, I, you know, what should I do? So I had a, a Celsius. And, I'll, send, um, I'll send you, I'll send you some. They're our number one sponsor at the company. Oh, are they really? So. Oh, oh, now yeah. I'm, now I have it before every game. Oh, yeah. But I was sitting there in the booth and I'm exhausted, right? It's just been a mode. You cried all day and it's emotionally draining and you, it's four games in four days in four different places and all the prep and everything that goes into it. And then an hour before the game, my uh one of my buddies from boston golf sue Curtin, sent me a, a picture and it was from boston golf club and it was a giant rainbow going right over the top of the place and i said is that now rick lived right across the street from the course and they said yeah we're sitting here on the porch talking about rick laughing crying wow. we can't believe we're in shock and all of a sudden there's a rainbow right over the top of the course you know and i'm like and i got a jolt of electricity like and again we're talking about it earlier like people don't care how far away you are from the rink or if you really can't see the action as well as they really don't just, just call the game. Don't make excuses, but you know, they don't know that there's stuff like that. Like yeah. I almost couldn't pick my head up an hour before the game. I was so, but they still expect you to go on there and, you know, be Mr. Energy and get everything right. And, uh, but we're human beings like everybody else. But, uh, anyway, it's a very long winded answer to your, to your <laughs> question. But I love to see my sister. I love to play golf, you mm -hmm. know, um, and around New York City, obviously, there's some. I never, I never, I can never tell if it's Ridgewood or Ridgefield. It's Ridgewood, right? Ridgewood, yeah, that's right. That's a couple of towns Ridgewood. over from me. I took Ray out there last year. My friends Nancy and Amory Slot are members there. We went there on an off day, had a great time. Um, so golf would be one of them. And then everybody has a million friends in New York. So um, you know, you try to see friends, get a workout in, um, make sure you rest. Yeah. This part of the playoffs. Even for the announcers, it's a grind, right? So, um, you know, hydrate, get get enough sleep. <laughs> so hey, don't, don't be, be afraid. To, don't be afraid to tell me I'm around on Thursday. You know, there might be an off day. All right, we'll take it with us. The, uh, well, I think it's, oh, sorry, I didn't mean oh. to flip you. Yeah, <laughs> finger. I'm still on the on the IL. The, uh, uh, I forgot about the, that. the longest longest finger injury in the history of life. But okay. uh, the pin comes out. Next Wednesday. Like Happy Gilmore, the nail comes out next week? Oh, yeah. The, the <laughs> This has been just be eight and a half weeks. And I had a cast for eight weeks before that, which didn't work. You and I talked about that off the air. But the, mm -hmm. um, yeah, six o'clock in the morning after game four in Florida, I'm flying back here to Boston to go to Mass General to have them take the pin and the screw out. Thank God, finally. Mm -hmm. And hopefully my little boo-boo is finally here. <laughs> but I have not played golf in several months, and it's driving me crazy. Well, outside of golf, you should avoid Avery or, or else you'll end up at Tau at night with the New York Giants. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, won't, that won't help the rest. The There's the a day I that. probably could have hung out in those spots, but I'm probably a little too old now to hang out there. I was going to say, once you get the pin out and the Rangers make the Stanley Cup finals during your off day, we'll uh, we'll play.
we'll go to you and we'll bring Ferraro. Nobody, I was, I, my only really important job for Ray is during the playoffs, I am his golf concierge. Like I took him to Boston golf, which is a top 75 America. Took him to Ridgewood. I got us on to old Chatham down in Raleigh a couple of years ago, or maybe last year, which is a great spot. I mean, we played some nice spots. Um, we played out in Denver. Dave Jackson hooked us up out there. So we'll uh, we'll do it. I'm in. And, uh, and Ray loves to play. And he's pretty solid. You want him as your partner. He's probably like a seven handicap. Love that. One of those annoying people that every drive is straight down the middle and the ball goes straight up toward the green. And, <laughs> If you're yeah. doing pickleball, I'll be your guy, but golf, Avery can be your guy. Yeah, I need to learn. My sister, Erin, yeah. my sainted sister at MSK, uh, she signed up for pickleball lessons a few months ago, and she's addicted. Mm-hmm. We come out of MSG after these games, and it's 11 o'clock at night in those that new fitness place, right? You know, kind of in the alley where we go, go to our hotel. Um, those courts are loaded at 11 o'clock at night uh, with people in there playing pickleball, so... I was eager to learn. And then a friend of mine is a physical therapist. I mentioned it the other day. And he said, like, I see more people because of pickleball injuries. Yeah. A lot of knee injuries. Yeah. He said, he mm-hmm. says, there's something, it's a lot of bending and moving and people aren't used to that and they don't stretch enough, whatever. Yeah, he, they're said, not stretching. I'm seeing, he said, I could almost do my entire practice now just on pickleball injuries. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sean, I, I, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for the time, but I have, I have one more for you. And I need, I actually need Avery's permission for it because Avery's a very superstitious guy. Okay, um, go ahead. So I, you teased the world's most anxious arena, which I still think is unbelievable. Can you tease Eric a, Wolf is our programming guy who I would have had to give credit for that. Fair and enough. And a big Yankee fan, by the way. He does all of our hockey programming at ESPN. He's a great, great guy. And a good golfer, too, to speak of. <laughs> if it's okay with Avery, I would love for you to tease – and for the first time in 10 years, the New York Rangers are going to the Stanley Cup final. You can give okay. us one of those. Avery, do you approve? <laughs> I can approve. Yeah. Especially <laughs> if, we, if we play golf together, we're good. Mm-hmm. We're good. And for the first time in 10 years, since Avery was six years old, the Rangers <laughs> are going to the Stanley Cup final. Imagine that on ESPN, Ava. You know, but I never, that's another thing. Like, um, to use as a broadcaster, you know, you're going to call the big game and one of these teams is going to advance to the Stanley Cup final when there's, you know, five teams left as we're talking now that have a chance to win the Stanley Cup mm-hmm. and one of them is going to win. So do you kind of script what you're going to say at that big moment or you just go with the moment and say whatever comes in your head? I think there's always room for both. Um, mm-hmm. You know, depending on the play too, it's tough. Think right? about it, but don't make it sound scripted. Exactly. But like, there are moments where it's perfect, right? Like Kenny, you know, you mentioned um, he called the the second Lightning Stanley Cup, and he said Lightning strikes twice. You know, that was a that was a great one. Probably thought about that ahead of time, but definitely it didn't. did. Yeah, that's a great one. Those are good if they don't sound scripted. Mm-hmm. But like you know, I think uh, it, it all. De- I mean, with the Rangers and and the the Panthers, it's something interesting too about these teams that are left. And I believe Arda actually tweeted it after Colorado was eliminated none of the five teams that are left have won a Stanley cup in this generation or in this decade or what is it? The century millennium? century. Yeah. I couldn't think of the word. Millennium? Yeah. Jesus. yeah. Since oh, you were, there, you were there, Johnny, you got it. Yeah. That was, thanks for the save. Um, <laughs> well, but uh, you know, I think that's something cool about, you know, these teams that are left too. No, no one's done it since the year 2000. So. Yeah. We'll, see. well, it'll be good. It's good when it gets spread around, you know, and they're great I- fan bases and um Lively atmospheres everywhere we go. And uh, yeah. I'm sweating right now. We can we find go, they build us a low booth. <laughs> yeah. I've always wanted to ask how he rose, how, if he if he came up with the, and the Rangers have one more hill to climb, and it, but it's Mount Vancouver. That was like, mm-hmm. I don't know if that was, if that was spur of the moment, that's crazy. Like, it had to have been. Oh, double yeah, overtime. Yeah. Sometimes it is. Like sometimes, like we talk about the, the kid line growing up before you. I didn't think about that ahead of time. It just sort of. That was good comes into your head and it's, you know, not that it's rivals the examples that you mentioned, but you know, sometimes in real time, you think to yourself like, Oh, that wasn't bad. I know that was actually, that was actually pretty good. <laughs> you know? Most of the time it's just call and get out of the way. Like when poster scored the game seven goal here mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago, um, call the goal and stop talking. Right. And just let people enjoy the pictures and the sounds. And it's, when people keep going on and on and on, then it starts to feel to me like they just want to be attached to the moment when yeah. there's nothing you can say that's better than the, the pictures and sound. So that's what you hope for, right? A game seven 
overtime game winning goal, uh, somebody wins the Stanley Cup. That would that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. On the road, though, it's tougher when you got to fill the the noise with the crowd, right? On the well, that, road. that's the other yeah. thing. That's like sometimes we get accused of being biased, right? So Rangers Tampa Bay uh, two years ago in the conference final. Um, you know, have you been to Tampa Bay? The family? Been. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, you there. take this freight elevator up, right? That takes a month. So you got to make sure you get there like three hours before the face off to make sure you're in the booth by the time the game starts. So <laughs> there's this gentleman who's there, you know, is the elevator operator and nice guy. We talked as the years gone along on the way up and down. So I get on the elevator and he's kind of making a face at me. He said, I need to talk to you. So I said, uh, you were a little too excited when the Rangers scored the other night. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, here's how this works. When the home team scores, you're going to yell louder because you're yelling over the crowd and you're yelling to hear yourself, you know, even with headphones on, you, it gets drowned out. And you, if you don't yell, you're not going to hear yourself. And we mm -hmm. all want to hear ourselves. So um, I said, so you're in the elevator when the games are here. So you probably don't hear the way I yell when Tampa Bay scores a goal here, but believe me, I'm yelling just as loud. So, yeah. you know, I, I have this thing to talk about Twitter, but my spotter, Zach <laughs> or Pat in college football, uh, on the way home sometimes on Saturdays, because he lives here in Boston too. If we, we're flying back or if we go out for a couple of drinks after the game, I'll say, okay, read me a couple of the nastiest, <laughs> or funniest, really funniest ones. Yeah. So we did Florida State Clemson last year, I think it was. And he starts laughing. I'm like, these must be really mean. He said, no. He said, I'm going to read you like six in a row. Sean McDonough is blatantly cheering for Florida State. <laughs> Why does Sean McDonough hate Florida State? Sean McDonough is cheering for Clemson. Why does Sean McDonough hate Clemson? You know, it's like <laughs> the same people watching the same game. So, mm -hmm. you know. At least uh, it's consistent. I can look right into this camera. Too. I don't care. I really <laughs> yeah. don't. You know, I'd like seven really exciting games uh, with a big audience. I think that'll be our social media clip. Just you saying into the camera, I don't care. <laughs> I really don't. Why wouldn't we want the Rangers to do well? Right. It's the biggest market. It's the, you know, it's to, to think that, you know, the network that carries uh, the national hockey or any sport wouldn't want a New York team to do well. is kind of silly. If you think mm -hmm. about it. From yeah. Yeah. The factual. So, um, amen. I think, yeah. well, I think we're going to have record ratings. I really do. Uh, the ratings have been way up all year anyway, you know, and I think this is just going to be a continued continuation of it in part because the Rangers are there and it's a really compelling matchup. So it's, uh, it's going to be awesome. Can't so wait. Rangers in seven. Sure. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they went, when I was on the, uh, the red shirt crew Panther podcast, I, I took Florida in seven. So. Yeah. Oh, red shirt crew. That's good. When I, when I started out doing the world series at CBS, they used to have me do all these radio talk shows and I would change my pick. So I, half the time I'd I'll, I'll take the Toronto blue Jays. And on the other half, I'd take, you know, the Atlanta Braves or whatever, just so, yeah. you know, not that anybody's comparing notes, but not I, to me, it's probably where I made a mistake. I picked Carolina to win the Stanley Cup before the year began, so I just didn't mm -hmm. want to change my pick when the playoffs started. But it's a mistake if you pick the team that doesn't have the best goaltender. And I do yeah. think, you know, Bob Rosky, as we've seen, can be as good as anybody. But to me, he's not quite as consistent. You know, Igor is just, he's like machine-like in these playoffs. Mm -hmm. So, and, and ever since the All-Star break, really. So I, I think that's the Ranger advantage. You know, can they deal with the, smothering physicality of florida um i think will be the key you know that's they're, they're really really hard to play against um mm -hmm. so it's gonna be a great series so many great storylines on both sides i want to tell you one story before we do let you go and i do apologize again for holding you no, that's uh, okay. i i always do this like i always say one last question i have four more you're saving um, me from doing my homework here really, uh, <laughs> those are the charts there you go those are some of the yeah those are the new ones that came today updated mm -hmm. stats sort of thing mm -hmm. Love the charts. Do them. Uh, do them. I know they're a grind. Just doing them myself for color. But yeah, they are a grind. Uh, you mentioned the radio that you, you know, you. And that's the other thing, right? Why prepare? Because you never have time to tell a story. Anymore. No. Right? That's the one thing I learned at the beginning. Like you can't launch into a story that's more than one sentence long because you get seven seconds. 
something, yeah, something bad is going to happen. And you usually need to do it when the guy's standing behind his own net waiting for a line change or something, then you, you're reasonably safe. So I don't know why we prepare all this stuff because it's never going to get in anyway, but it's yeah. just, it's good. To, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, you're good. I actually, that changes my whole thing. But I think the funniest thing, I, I forget which game it was. It might, the, the first game that had ESPN back in the NHL, I think Wayne Gretzky was telling a story as a goal was scored. And it's like, do you tell Wayne Gretzky to stop talking? Like, what are you supposed to do? No. <laughs> what no. are you supposed to do? No. Were you the on play, that call? Was the that play-by-play play guy should not be in the middle of his own story when the puck goes into that. You know, I, I can control when I deviate back to the action or when I when I don't. Mm -hmm. You know, I told the story. You guys, I might have heard it um, on, on the Empty Netters podcast. I think I told it on their podcast. But when I started doing golf for CBS in the late 90s, at, at the Masters, Frank Trichinian is a legendary producer, director of golf, or he invented golf on TV, basically. He said, hey, we want you on here in part because you're a good storyteller. We want you to tell stories, but in golf, when we go to you, we never know if we're going to be on your hole for five seconds or for a minute. So learn how to tell a story that can end at the end of every sentence. Like, for example, Tiger. I talked to Tiger Woods on the practice range, and he's using a new putter. Okay, you can stop there. And, but, and the reason he's using a new putter is he wanted a longer putter because his back hurts or something. He doesn't want to have to bend over. So you could stop there too. And you, so you, and that's a great skill to learn. And um, so I, I really, I have had to uh, adapt that to hockey. Like we were talking about Jack Drury. You know, it's like, yeah. I know everything about Jack's whole life, basically. But so you want to get in, you know, his mom was a great athlete and the whole thing. But you can't, if you do every tentacle and his uncle is Chris Drury, you know, you're never going to get the whole thing in. So you gotta, you gotta pick your spots. Did but I interrupt yeah. your question again? No, honestly, you're, you're <laughs> so fine. I, I actually don't even want to keep thinking you. that if this goes on long enough, Cody's going to show up. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know. We can, we can see time. if he's free right now. Uh, and he could come, he'll be honestly, if he hopped in, he'd be like, so like distraught, flustered, right? yeah. yeah, he's so flustered. Oh, uh, that, he's the, right. he's the best though. And you guys should definitely meet and you'd love him. Oh, um, I'm sure we will. Yeah, he's he's the best. So now I feel like I, I interrupted your last uh, question, and I apologize. No. So Emily and Ray are used to me interrupting them. Anyway, <laughs> no, no, so. <laughs> you're, you're good. Oh, I, I was gonna say, uh, I don't know if you know Bruce Boudreau at all, but when you talked about how you gave the radio stations different answers, like I talked to Bruce Boudreau about that moment in like 2011 when the Rangers fans chanted, "Like, can you hear us?" because of something he said on the radio. Like he told me he went on local Washington, D.C. radio and they asked him who has better fans, the Rangers or the Capitals. What was he supposed to say? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that's the other thing, right? Yeah. People take something. I made a comment about uh, Jake Gensel okay. a couple a year or two ago for Pittsburgh. And it was all like, you know, he's a 40 goal scorer. He's this, he's that. He's a great guy. He's a great line mate. He's a great. Da, 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 da. Other than that, he's not good at anything. Like I said, everything <laughs> you, you said. You said that. <laughs> and this guy sent me the nastiest letter about how dare you disparage, you know, Jake Kansas. I want to say, have you ever heard of sarcasm? Like at the end of the show, <laughs> it's pretty clear. You know? So that's why I say, if you let stuff like that actually bother you, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to drive yourself crazy. That's funny though. That's that's actually really funny that someone got worked up like that. Um, oh yeah, I mean, and, yeah. and and it was intended entirely as a compliment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just so. I I actually over the years have gone less and less to sarcasm because I, I I understand now that some people just don't understand it and yeah. think that you're. Uh, it's just hard when you're from the Northeast, right? Because we're we're all, yeah we're all sarcastic by nature. Thousand percent. Um, anything that you have before we let you go that you'd like to shout out? No, I really enjoyed this. I appreciate you guys having me. And, yeah. Uh, just, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be so much fun. You know, this mm -hmm. is, uh, when I knew when I was five years old, that this is what I wanted to do for a living, that this is what you're dreaming about when you do it. So, um, hope it's a great series and, uh, hope to run into you guys in person somewhere along. Yeah. Way. Well, I'll see you at game one and we can make an agreement that if the Rangers win this series, we'll get you back on and Cody can be a part of it. No question. And we'll play golf because I think actually yeah. it'll be easier. I think in the Stanley Cup final, the travel, there's going to be two, two travel two days. days between. Yeah. Yeah, two days. So I would uh, love that. That opens up the golf opportunity. And and by then I won't be the bionic man anymore. <laughs> there you go. Well, Sean, actually, we really appreciate this. Channel 5 in Boston a couple of weeks ago, they had Duke Castiglione's dad does the Red Sox games on the radio. He's on the ABC affiliate. They did a pregame before the Toronto game seven 
So at the end, he went to shake my hand. I had the microphone. It's I, I still I'm so used to holding the microphone in this hand. The producer said to me a couple times, "Can't you hold the microphone in your left hand so it doesn't look like you're giving the audience the finger and the on camera at the beginning?" Uh, but I just it doesn't. It's like playing golf left handed, you know. So anyway, Duke went to shake my hand. I had was holding the microphone here, so I kind of gave him the lefty, and I said, "I'm sorry, I can't shake you." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not flipping off your audience. The, yeah, uh, but. I have a pin and a screw in my finger. So that's great. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. I'll, I'll deliver you uh, uh, pop, you popcorn in between the first and the second on Wednesday. Yeah. Come on up and say hi. I got you. I'll be up there. Be I'm in the press box every game. I'll, I'll, I'll see you. Um, thank get you. Get out of your parents' house. Get, you know, it's, 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 yeah. A, favorite bit of memorabilia back there. What's your, what's right. your favorite? So, so this stick right here, this is the, this is the, greatest story I, i've had season tickets my entire life I, I we didn't do family vacations growing up it was always just rangers <laughs> rangers rangers same section uh as they held up sign now i can die in peace and henrik lundquist was notorious for when he would have a big game he would go out as the first star and throw his stick and every time he would do it he would either go straight out from the tunnel the tunnel used to be different at msg it used to be in the center now it's off to the side he would go out to the center or he would do a quick turn and throw it there and we were we're on the side where the Rangers shoot twice a little bit closer to uh, the gate where the uh, opposing team comes out. And every time I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I, I'm never this. I'm never going to get a stick. And I wait and I wait. And he has a shutout in his uh, second season against uh, the Avalanche. And he comes out and he literally turns straight towards me. He's staring directly at me. I'm kind of on the ledge. So I'm almost hanging over the glass at this point. And he throws it, but it goes completely over my head. I'm, I must be what, eight years old at this time goes completely over my head. I'm watching this thing. Like it's like a movie, like go over my head and nobody other than my grandpa catches it and he catches it and he's wrestling with this big dude who who also caught it. He's like, it's for my grandson. It's for my grandson gets this stick. And, um, you know, I've been offered money for it. It's priceless. It's never leaving this room, no matter what. Good work, grandpa. Yeah. Yeah, he, he wrestled, he wrestled a big dude for it. And did the big dude let it go or did it? Yeah, did this when he said it was for, for me that, yeah, he let he it go. He could point at you because you were right there. Yeah, exactly. It was a it was an amazing moment. But yeah, that's that's yeah. forever. My dad was always like, oh, get it signed, maybe sell it. You know, when he goes to Hall of Fame, I'm like, nope. It's By not the way, signed. How good is he on TV? Not oh, to... he is. He's incredible. He's, he's, he's good really at everything, good. you know, yeah. and, and I yeah, actually – a little annoying that way, probably. But <laughs> yeah, he's, he's so good at everything. everything. I want to see his documentary, though, that just came out yeah. on Netflix. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. We really appreciate this. Uh, have a great day. Some travels, and we'll see you Wednesday. Me. Looking forward to it. Thanks. All right, Sean. Have a good one. Big thanks to Sean McDonough for hopping on the pod. We're already in a group chat with him. Avery is talking about golf and setting up a tea time. But what an awesome guy. I hope Ranger fans uh, have different feelings toward him if you don't like him. Um, really sweet guy. And, uh, yeah, Avery, any thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think anyone should hate him at all. I think that he does his job so well. He, he's worked in the industry. He knows what he's doing. And I can't wait to just spend more time and hang out with him. Yeah. He sounds like the coolest dude ever, not just on the mic, but out in regular, normal public people. I don't even know what I was about to say yep. there, but you know what all I right. meant. We've been talking a lot. My, dude, we've been talking for yeah, so We've long. been on here for like three hours. Um, <laughs> but yeah, great, great interview with Sean. Really excited for you know the whole Eastern Conference final. Um, it's going to be a blast and we got what, two more, two more sleeps till it happens. Yep. Um, but you know, it's going to be a fun one. It's going to be a nerve wracking one. You know, the first two rounds haven't really been that nerve wracking until, you know, that game six. So we'll see what happens, but, uh, I feel pretty confident going in. Yeah, I think, I think that it's team of destiny. He, he thought he, Sean, Sean thought we were over. We brought that up like five bit. times. Yeah. <laughs> but how, how could you not, yeah. you know, yeah. how could you not? Everything feels, everything feels right right now. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll send it off and uh, we'll talk to you guys after game one. All right. LFGR, baby. Let's go.